In yesterday's episode, we covered some overarching philosophical themes that emerged in the Lex Friedman, Charles Hoskinson podcast. Today, we're going to get down to specifics. Ready? Let's go. We're going to do something a little bit unorthodox. We're going to cover this podcast from the back to the front because this was a five-hour podcast, right? A really good one, but five hours. And let's face it, we're all busy. Very few of us have five hours to devote to a podcast. So we're going to cover it from the back to the front because I think a lot of people probably were able to listen to like maybe an hour, maybe two hours, and then they had to go do something else. And they probably missed a lot of the stuff that happened after those first one or two hours. So we're going to start at the back and then move forward. Also, we've got the 100th episode of the Army of Spies Cardano Rumor Rundown coming up, coming up soon, next week, this coming week, we're going to hit episode 100. To celebrate that, we're going to have an Ask Me Some Things, so feel free to ask me whatever question you like. I probably won't answer questions that are about me. <laughs> if it's something about me, I would love to answer those questions. It'd be super fun, but this channel is not about that. This channel is about all of us together. The Army of Spies is really all of us together. And it's about our participation in the Cardano ecosystem, right? It's about what we're doing in Cardano. So feel free to hit me up with questions. I won't, I probably won't answer any questions that are about me, but ask me, feel free to ask me anything else. And I don't know if this will work or not, but let's see if we can collect enough questions to turn it into an episode or you know, some segment of some episode right around 100. So if there aren't enough questions, we won't do it. But if there are, we'll send the questions to black at gmail.com or you can post them below. Lex asked Charles about El Salvador. And I think Charles hit on what I think is the most important part of this whole El Salvador development. And that's what we've covered on this channel that Caitlin Long highlighted that there are certain reciprocal relationships between nation states where we acknowledge each other's legal tender currencies as foreign currencies. So Charles pointed out that this could lead to some other countries having to allow Bitcoin on things like Forex exchanges. Caitlin Long had a really long explanation about the uh, definition of money in the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, which informs a lot of the law here in the U.S. Feel free to go back and look at that episode about legal tender if you want more details on that. But Charles also pointed out that, and he didn't call out any particular leaders. We talked in a previous episode also about how President Bukele of El Salvador has been criticized as possibly being a proto-authoritarian. You know, he had the episode where he brought soldiers into the Legislative Assembly and he fired five judges on the Supreme Court, right? When both of those arms of the government were not not doing what he wished they'd do. Charles pointed out that if you have authoritarian impulses, crypto might be bad for you because crypto tends to push power to the edges. And Charles kind of speculated that maybe some of these, these autocratic leaning national leaders didn't quite realize that yet. Maybe, and I'm putting words in his mouth here, but you know, obviously it's, it, it's pretty obvious why, if you're under the thumb of the International Monetary Fund, it's pretty obvious why you would like Bitcoin. You'd like the idea of Bitcoin. But Charles speculated that maybe some of these leaders haven't thought out how much Bitcoin and other cryptos might push power from the central government out to the edges. With larger nation states, he also pointed out something kind of interesting. He sort of identified these two extremes. He said, too little crypto and you end up with the US or China. Too much crypto and it's no longer a nation state. I think what he means by that is that if you have too little crypto, then the national government has complete control over the financial system. If you have too much crypto, maybe you no longer have a nation state. And there's really good, uh, there's really good kind of like little essays about this online that you could you could find if you Google, you know, does crypto kill nation states? Uh, you know, people people have speculated uh, about this. You know, if crypto, if everybody's using crypto, can you know, it, it's like the ultimate libertarian version of crypto where the government can't track where the crypto is going. I mean, they can track it, but they don't know what what accounts belong to who. 
you know, can they effectively tax the citizenry? If they can't effectively tax the citizenry, does the nation state continue to exist? You know, that line of thought, which is really interesting. Um, so Charles is kind of identifying that there, there probably is going to end up being some kind of middle ground here. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's sort of unlikely that every nation in the world goes along and there's not more crypto adoption. There's obviously going to be more crypto adoption. Is it, is it going to become this too much crypto scenario where too much crypto from the viewpoint of the national governments, where it's impossible for the national government to, uh, to continue to exist because they can't effectively tax the citizenry because they don't know when anybody's making money. Right. Um, and this made th this kind of like tied into the conversation that Charles and Lex had about um, governance in Cardano, which is also a discussion inevitably about digital identity on Cardano. So Charles pointed out some things we hadn't heard yet. And that's that Cardano is thinking of trying to do voter registration and the Republican and Democratic primaries in Wyoming in 2022 with Cardano digital identity solutions. This would obviously be very groundbreaking if, you know, he said they're starting work next year. If they do actually hold Republican and Democratic primaries on the Cardano, using some kind of Cardano digital identity solution, or if they do voter registration using some kind of Cardano digital identity uh, solution. The timing is very good for this. Charles pointed out after the recent elections, there's a lower level of trust in the legitimacy of our elections in the US. And this is probably the perfect timing to leapfrog into a digital voting system. Charles also made a point about this that I think is often overlooked. Things like Atala Prism are layer two. And the cool part is because Cardano is a native multi-asset system, anything that works for ADA will work for any asset you create in Cardano. So you could use solutions like Atala Prism for your own asset you create within Cardano. So, you know, he didn't get into this level of detail at this point, but you could just create a Wyoming voter coin as a native asset on the Cardano blockchain and Atala Prism would work just fine for that because it's not necessarily tied to ADA, it can work equally well for any asset on the blockchain. On the topic of Polkadot, Charles said that Polkadot is like Ethereum 1.5. It's basically what Ethereum should have been. But he also said they focused a lot on quick commercial adoption and Silicon, Silicon Valley adoption, whereas Cardano had a very different business philosophy, philosophy. And they focused on things like, how do you make sure that all ADA holders could participate in the network? He said they don't have native multi-asset, which I think is an important distinguishing, distinguishing point. But he also said that Cardano might actually fork Polkadot on a private network and sort of play around with it because they know that Polkadot made a consensus protocol that's very similar to Ouroboros after, after looking at the Ouroboros protocol. So when Cardano considers sidechains, it'll be very easy for them to look at how parachains work in Polkadot and that there's no shame in just adopting anything they've done, which is kind of like the beauty of, uh, which is the beauty of open architectures. But Charles also said that Mithril might allow for Cardano to make even better side chains than Polkadot has. On the topic of Cardano's Hydra layer two solution versus Bitcoin's Lightning Network layer two solution versus Ethereum ZK rollups layer two solution, Charles had some really interesting things to say. He said Hydra is kind of what the Bitcoin's Lightning Network could have been if it had been co-designed with Bitcoin when Bitcoin came out, as opposed to created many years later as sort of a solution to patch a hole. Um, in relationship to ZK rollups, uh, Charles made a point that I think, again, has been probably overlooked by a lot of people. He said that he kind of explained what ZK rollups are. We've talked about this before on this channel. Um, he said that the advantage of having service providers running actual channels on layer two, like you would with Hi Cardano's Hydra, is that eventually you can have them do other things like creating cross-chain bridge interoperability with other blockchains by using wrapped assets or DEX that just swaps assets. And with ZK rollups, this isn't a conversation you end up having. So Charles is thinking about Cardano's layer two as not just a way to create layer two scaling, but layer two will be um, akin to an analogy he often makes with biology. 
where he says, hey, you start with single celled organisms and you could have the entire blockchain just be single celled organisms. Everybody does exactly the same things and plays the same exact role, or at least they could. But he says, actually, a better way to do it is to ha differentiate different types of tissue like the human body. It's not every cell doesn't do exactly the same thing. We have certain cells, you know, that are part of our cardiac tissue that eventually forms a heart and, you know, pumps blood Then we've got feet and eyes and things like that. And layer two is going to be where we add on the feet and the eyes to the organism, just like the way a tall prism adds digital identity. It's a different type of tissue than say, you know, just a straight up stake pool or a delegator. So it looks like Cardano has in mind uh, a more expansive scope for layer two than just the simple scaling solutions that Bitcoin and Ethereum seem to have in mind. Lex asked about Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey, of course, is a Twitter founder and also leads the Square and Cash apps, which only support Bitcoin. Lex was basically like, what's up with that? Why, why only Bitcoin? Charles referred to the strategy as just the tip, which was probably the most hilarious part of the entire podcast, <laughs> the Jack Dorsey, just the tip segment. Uh, but Charles said, you know, like, look, this whole this whole Bitcoin thing has become kind of a kind of a religion. They just say it as gospel that proof of work is more secure than proof of stake, but they never quite get around to providing any proofs that that's actually the case. There's never any like actual evidence that proof of work is more secure than proof of stake. It's just gospel. And the second you dispute it, there's a problem. Lex asked about oracles, dApps, and DEXs, and Charles made a good point here. He said, even if your whole blockchain is very secure, if you have to trust the oracle to do sort certain computation, it can blow your whole information security model. So if the oracle on layer two isn't very tightly coupled with the base protocol, you may run into more problems than it if, if it is very tightly integrated with the base protocol. And this was kind of a commentary on Chainlink and Ethereum, basically pointing out, you know, Chainlink may have great things going on, but if there's not a tight integration between the base protocol and the Oracle, you may run into different or more information security problems than if those two are tightly coupled. Uh, Charles said that the failure of dApps is one of the things that keeps him up at night because he says the base protocol can be blamed for any dApp failure just like uh, Vitalik was blamed for the hack of the DAO. You know, he points out that Vitalik had nothing to do with that, but it was seen as this great failure of the, the whole Ethereum ecosystem and of, and of Ethereum itself, which was kind of unfair. But Charles talked about the University of Wyoming Smart Contract Engineering Institute initiative, which we've talked about. We've talked about a little bit here. I don't think we had a name for it last time we talked about it, but uh, this is the idea that the Cardano and the University of Wyoming would create standards for smart contracts, and perhaps they would even have uh, security audits of sorts. And you know, you you'd get like a little green, kind of like the blue check mark on Twitter. You get a green check mark on your smart contract if uh, auditors had reviewed it under the standards set out by the Smart Contract Engineering Institute. And then you could rest a little easier using DApps that you knew had been sort of like audited and approved under this set of standards. With DEXs, this was the most, this is the most interesting part to me. So Charles said, look, if, if DEXs want to exist, if DEXs want to exist and they want to allow their customers to use US dollars, there's probably going to be regulation and the regulated ones will be the ones that survive. Um, the goal with the DEX, of course, is to cut out the central actor. So the second you say like, okay, we are, we are going to be subject to regulation, all of a sudden you probably have to do things like KYC because the regulator, Charles points out, the regulators, are, they're going to come in and talk about money laundering. They're, they're going to talk about narco trafficking and terrorism, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Charles describes it as a word salad of, you know, like bad things. Um, but the big hammer the regulators will have will be access to the U S dollar. So if a DEX wants to remain unregulated and operate in the shadows without allowing its customers access to the U S dollar, that will probably always exist. 
But the ones that want to allow their customers to actually access the US dollar will probably, the surviving versions of those will probably only be regulated entities. Charles has talked about this before. This is part of why Cardano has these digital identity solutions because they feel like regulation is probably inevitable. There's probably no way around it. And the only way to do KYC um, with crypto is to have digital identity. Lex asked Charles about NEPA POWs. NEPA POWs are non-interactive proofs of proof of work. Charles explained that this is a brainchild of uh, Dionysus Syndros and Agalos Kiaias. Um, he, and he gave a pretty, pretty interesting um, sort of analogy to explain exactly what NEPA POWs were. He said, imagine you've got an engine, right? And like every 5,000 strokes, uh, one of the cylinders does something weird. It does something weird. Like every 500 strokes, it does something weird. And you can kind of record like, instead of recording like, okay, you know, we just had, you know, a thousand, a thousand strokes of the cylinder. You can just record it in terms of how many times it does this weird thing every 500 strokes. So you just have like two, you just record two of these weird strokes, but you'd know that that actually represents a thousand strokes because you know what happens once every 500 strokes. And he said, this is like a really interesting way to represent a long range of data history on a blockchain with a very short proof, which obviously be very useful for light wallets and side chains, because then a light wallet wouldn't have to, it wouldn't have to, um, it wouldn't have to uh, store all the data about the blockchain. It could just store this very short proof. Speaking of short proofs representing larger collections of data, you could tell that Lex knew quite a bit about the Cardano ecosystem because he asked Charles about Ergo and the ways in which Cardano and Ergo were gonna interact. Charles talked all about how they actually used Ergo to test a lot of things because Ergo, uh, although it's a proof of work system, uh, it actually had smart contracts before Cardano got smart contracts running just, just due to the fact that you know Ergo was was uh, taking a more aggressive sort of development path, you know, and and uh, doing doing what they're doing. Uh, but he said that one of the really interesting things so we talked all about how they tested certain things like stable coins on on Ergo before they even had that before they had the capability to do so on Cardano. But he talked about something really interesting. Uh, Alex Chirpinoy of Ergo figured out how to use something called Sigma Protocol in in crypto and blockchains. So Sigma protocol is a way to express scripts. Scripts are just small programs run by another program rather than a computer. The cool thing is that Sigma protocol is a concise way to get a proof that a script is correct without running the whole program. So this is obviously very valuable for redeemer validation model like we have in Plutus, the smart contract programming language in Cardano, since it, since uh, these uh, representations of a proof that a script is correct could give you a mathematical artifact of the state of the system quickly. We've discussed in the past how Cardano, Ouroboros, it's, it's a system and Plutus with, within Cardano, it's a system that just involves local state. Right, uh, a script can see the it can see the things happening around it. You know, transactions, transactions that it's directly interacting with. Whereas in Ethereum, they have this global state system where a script can look at anything happening in the whole blockchain. It looks at the whole state of the global system, which makes it very difficult to figure out how to do sharding. Whereas sharding is like basically almost built in because of uh, Cardano's local state system. So obviously, if if Sigma protocol is a concise way to get a representation of a proof that a script is correct without running the whole program, and this can be a mathematical artifact of the state of the system that you can get quickly, it's almost like Cardano could have the best of both worlds, right? They could have this mathematical artifact of the state of the system, but still limit scripts to just looking locally, which gives you all the benefits in terms of sharding. Charles and Lex also talked about the current state of Bitcoin and the Bitcoin conference in Miami that Charles recently attended. Uh, Charles pointed out that a ton of the vendors there were like selling luxury goods, like diamond encrusted watches. 
And he compared this to back in the old days, the old Bitcoin conferences he used to go to. I think he mentioned the one in San Jose in 2013. And he said it was like uh, just a bunch of people trying to help other people and teach people about Bitcoin, learn about Bitcoin. And the whole thing was creating a better money. And he's like, nobody had any money. Nobody's making any money off Bitcoin yet. So it was all just this like very positive, helpful thing. And now it's like everybody's rich and it's not, it's not about the same things anymore. So Charles kind of compared it to, you know, he said that he pointed out the Bitcoin, nothing in Bitcoin is really attractive anymore. It's too old. The technology is ancient and it doesn't, it doesn't really evolve. It's like the 30 year old high school football star with a beer belly. BTC in a lot of ways is its own worst enemy. Uh, he said the developers attack any attempt to add programmability to the network and just the, the lack of a culture of evolution means that Ethereum probably beats Bitcoin nine out of 10 times because of this, this lack of a philosophy of evolution. Um, he also, so Lex, Lex came back with, yeah, but couldn't Bitcoin be the gold? Couldn't it be the digital gold? Like Ethereum and Cardano and other systems continue to evolve, do all the programmability stuff. Bitcoin is just the digital gold. Charles points out gold didn't make a very good financial system. We tried it for a long time under the Bretton Woods system. And eventually we, we dropped it. We got rid of it because it didn't, it didn't work very well. And he's kind of, you know, sort of implying that Bitcoin is going to have the same experience that, um, you know, that eventually this reserve system, this reserve system stops, stops having, stops having relevance. Charles also makes a good point in that this isn't just theoretical. The lightning network has effectively turned Bitcoin into a reserve system. The only problem with that logic is that if the lightning network is already a layer two operating on top of the Bitcoin reserve system, why won't why won't the developers, the core developers of Bitcoin allow Bitcoin to connect to other blockchains to act as additional layer twos? Finally, Lex asked a question that I think a lot of us probably asked ourselves as we first got in the Cardano system, why this choice of Haskell? Haskell is kind of a kind of a, a little bit of an exotic functional programming language right when you could have chosen a much more common imperative language uh charles points out that there's this giant gap so cardano obviously is very driven by academic paper publishing they have something like 105 uh peer-reviewed papers and the gap between academic papers and an imperative language is very large there's too much ambiguity between those two so you might have an academic paper written and then an attempt to uh, program that in an imperative language, and you end up with code that doesn't really reflect what was in the paper. He said that functional programming languages like Haskell are uh, a way to close that gap since ha Haskell is a lot closer to uh, the kind of thinking that goes into those academic papers. So there are even more exotic choices that would have been, you know, even more super correct, like Idris, Agda, or Isabel, but they sort of chose Haskell as a Goldilocks choice in that they were much more assured to get a uh, code that reflected what's in the papers, but it wasn't as super, super exotic as Idris, Agda, and Isabel, where you might only be able to get like seven people at your entire company that can, uh, that can write that code. They talked about many, many more items, but those are the topics that we are going to cover. Talk to you tomorrow.